We're here at the Peace Arch, a monument that marks the border between British Columbia and Washington State. And we're here to see a very small part of a massive piece of infrastructure, arguably one of the biggest machines in the world. We're here to see the 136,000 mile behemoth that is the Western Interconnection that runs as far north as the Columbian Peace Rivers here in Canada and as far south as Mexico. And this amazing piece of infrastructure is giving us a sneak peek into what a super savvy and smart macro grid could look like. The Fully Charged Show is generating positive energy with its live events all around the world. Next up, it's Fully Charged Live Canada. Click the top right of the screen to get your tickets today. A lot of renewable energy sources are intermittent and variable. And so when generation exceeds demand, sometimes that electricity has nowhere to go. And so a few things can happen. Either the generation gets curtailed, which seems like a bit of a waste, or it can be stored in localized distributed energy storage, or it can be sent where it's needed via long distance transmission lines. And that's where some really cool things start happening. Because the bigger the grid system, the more of renewable energy can be absorbed into it in a super savvy and sensible way. It's a bit like imagining you've got an unlimited supply of butter and instead of having to just chuck it on one tiny cracker, you can spread it very smoothly over a massive slice of bread. Send cheap hydro from mountainous BC, wind from windy Wyoming, or solar from here in sunny California, all to where that power is needed. And the double whammy is that it should A, reduce the number of backup power plants as we'll have a greater likelihood of meeting the localized peaks with renewables. And B, ultimately the wholesale price of energy should come down as there's greater supply in the market. And as we electrify heating, cooling and transport, this becomes even more important. But the challenge is geography. Grid scale renewable energy is not normally generated near cities where it needs to be used. So it has to be transported, and not just to the closest cities, but across whole states to capitalize on this big renewable energy seesaw bread buttering balancing act. And North America is big. Peace River is 750 miles away. Ricky is 1500 miles away. So for long distances, you need to think about how to catapult those electrons in the most efficient manner possible. We do a 20 year forecast it's informed by lots of stakeholder engagement, lots of working with industry around where our potential spot loads, big loads could be showing up, mines, the forest sector. And we plan out conceptually future routes, uh, the capacity that those, those transmission lines need to be, and that's where you get into some big technical decisions like what voltage, um, I know there's, there's lots of questions on DC versus AC transmission lines right now. Our asset planning team and our engineering team basically start the work on a future transmission line 10 years ahead of when it's going to be needed. From a transmission perspective, we are doing a lot of uh, wildfire resiliency work around vegetation because obviously vegetation is um, the fuel for wildfire, so we, we have very extensive vegetation management programs. We're looking at new materials for poles and structures. And for us on our transmission system in BC, redundancy is really important. So our ability to switch lines when one line goes off uh, and, and serve load through alternate paths that is key to our resiliency. And also being connected to the, the, um, the entire Western grid, um, that is another very important level of um, resiliency that we have. BC Hydro benefits in so many ways from being part of the, um, the Western interconnection. And I, I sort of think of it as, as sort of three, three areas. One is it, it helps with reliability. It also helps in terms of, of keeping our rates low and cost effectiveness. And third, I would say it, we're just part of that bigger drive to reduce fossil fuel, um, fossil fuels for, for energy generation and, and get in more renewables into everybody's grids. So behind me there is the Ingledale substation and that is taking AC power at a variety of different voltages so 60 kilovolts, 230 kilovolts, 500 kilovolts and stepping it down so it can supply domestic power. 
Now this is absolutely fascinating because it's taking power from as far away as Revelstoke Dam and Mica Dam and it's bringing it here before it can distribute it to those domestic homes. So the other thing that's coming out of the Ingledale substation is this 500 kilovolt AC transmission line that you can see above my head. And this is a very important 500 kilovolt transmission line because 36 kilometers that way, it meets the Bonneville Power Administration substation. And this forms an intertie, i.e. where two public utilities meet. So we've got BC Hydro meeting Bonneville Power Administration over there. And that is what is sending electricity over the border. Now, when you start thinking about whether to have AC power lines or DC power lines over those long distances, there's a couple of things that you need to consider. And when we've looked at long distance transmission lines previously, such as the one between Blythe and Norway, that was a DC line. But in British Columbia, it's a slightly different challenge because you've got power being created all the way in sort of pretty remote dams, you know, 700 miles away from this location, for example. But at the same time, as well as having to transport that electricity long distances, along the way, it needs to be siphoned off to support local towns and cities. And every time you have to siphon it off, if you had DC power, you'd have to convert it back into AC and then back into DC. And that creates a lot of cost at each of those substations. So AC definitely sort of simplifies that operation. Although yes, there certainly is a bit of a trade-off with the amount of losses that you get with AC versus DC. Now, I think the thing that is absolutely remarkable is that the electricity that's flying overhead, that's come from 700 miles away, admittedly in sort of some different form and has been stepped up and stepped down along the way, but that is phenomenal. Now, the other thing that's worth mentioning is that over there, you can see a 230 kilovolt line, and this one is a 500 kilovolt line. And you can see immediately that structurally those pylons are slightly different, and that's for a couple of reasons. Most notably, with a 500 kilovolt line, you've got much bigger and heavier conductors, so that slightly determines the form factor. But also, you have different parameters which determine how much space you need around those cables. That's what determines the amount of tree clearing that you need to do, and it's also what determines that triangle shape so that work can be conducted on the lines whilst they're still live to reduce that risk of having power outages. The Western Interconnection covers an enormous expanse, some 1.8 million square miles, meaning it spans a range of different climates, which results in different peak electricity usage between regions. For BC, that peak is in winter when the heating goes on, and in California, it's summer when the AC is blasting. Balancing these peaks by sending hydro and solar back and forth can smooth out and shave the peaks for each region. But this isn't yet possible across the whole of the US. The North American grid is split into three interconnections, East, West and Texas. And because of the huge distances across the continent, there are very few adequate interties linking the different interconnections. And that means it's very difficult to transport electricity nationally. The NREL led a study modelling a macro grid, where interconnections are linked by a nationwide long distance HVDC network. And behold, more clean electricity can be moved from the windiest, sunniest parts of the country to the power thirsty cities when it's needed, increasing the overall share of renewables that make up the grid. And as an additional bonus, it could also take advantage of not just the seasonal difference that exists between different geographies in the US, but also the time difference that exists from east to west coast, further reducing those peaks, smoothing out those peaks and making the grid greener. One of the beauties of the, the Western interconnection and any cross-jurisdictional interconnection is that you can manage energy, the resources and the loads across a much larger geographical footprint. And you're, you're managing across geography and you're managing across time, time periods. So the best example I have with this is California. It's a summer peaking utility. Their biggest loads are in the summer when it's hot and air conditioning is, is high. BC, we're a winter peaking uh, jurisdiction. So if California gets into a crunch with their resources, their, their energy resources, we actually are best equipped at that time of year, we have some extra capacity. We can move maintenance, we can move outage schedules, we can free up that capacity to serve California in the summer. And likewise, you know, when they have capacity in the winter and we, we have an energy crunch, we can call upon them to support us.
We have just driven an hour from the border and we're still seeing the same 500 kilovolt lines that are going to go down here to the Ingledale substation and beyond to Washington State. And they come from the Columbia and Peace Rivers. And yet despite humming with the proverbial lifeblood that keeps society going, not everyone loves a pylon, or at least not a new pylon. And yet these often weary webs are in desperate need of upgrades and expansions to make the grid greener and to prevent the blackouts that so often plague the US in extreme weather. But laying new power lines is contentious. The way in which you pay for them is complicated and they require careful handling of environmental, local community and landscape concerns. New transmission lines have to undergo onerous permitting processes, requiring permission from every city, county and state that they pass through. And meanwhile, a new natural gas pipeline only requires permission from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Without a doubt, permitting can cause headaches. There are around 2,000 gigawatts of renewable sources in the US that are ready to start generating, but are queuing to get a connection to regional grid networks. The permitting process and specifically NEPA studies, or National Environmental Protection Act studies, are undergoing reform, which is vitally important, as right now America needs to double how quickly it builds new power lines, or risks missing out on the 80% of the carbon reduction made possible by clean energy subsidies. But as much as NEPA studies may slow things down, they also prevent new natural gas pipelines getting an easy ride. Any reform to make transmission lines easier to approve risks making natural gas pipelines easier too. To help tackle this, NEPA studies now need to include the environmental consequences of a project not happening. So where does all of this leave us? Particularly as heat waves, extreme weather and wildfires place enormous strain on the grid and in some cases utilities have had to ask people to voluntarily use less power to avoid blackouts. We're here at the 500 kilovolt Meridian substation and there is a line from the 1970s and here is a newer one that came online in 2014. And what we've seen here today is that transmission lines are a massive, sprawling machine. They are such impressive pieces of infrastructure and critical to alleviating the pressure on the grid, making it greener and being much more strategic with use of renewable electricity. But despite that, we've also highlighted another issue. Clean electricity is more palatable when it's out of sight and out of mind. And transmission lines bring it closer to home, literally and figuratively. But surely having a visible grid that's so impressive and should be marvelled at is much more palatable than not being able to use energy reliably. So if you really stop and think about it, these machines are remarkable. If you like what you've seen here today, please do make sure to check out our full episode on the National Grid or our episode on Revelstoke Dam here in British Columbia.